Good afternoon. Today is March 1st, 1999. We're here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. And continuing with our Veterans Oral History Project, we have the pleasure this afternoon of interviewing Bob Dunbar. Good afternoon, Bob. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm fine. Could I just ask a little bit of family background sure. before we start the full interview? Do you mind my asking you your age? 76. 76 years old. And where you live? In Natick, on mm -hmm. Jamison Street. And your marital status? Uh, my wife Shirley passed away in 1984. And you have children? Two boys. I mean a boy and a girl. And any grandchildren? I have, uh, my son has two boys and my daughter has a boy and a girl. And where were you raised? In Natick. You were raised in Natick. What was the community like growing up? Well, I lived in East Natick originally, and it was on Cooper Road, a dirt road, right near Jennings' Pond. I'm sorry, right near? Jennings' Pond. Jennings' Pond, uh-huh. Was it a small neighborhood? Yes, very small. And the area around Jennings Pond, which I believe currently is not swimmable, was it it's then? It's dry. It's dr dry. Yeah. What was it like when you were well, we a youngster? Swam in it. We fished in it. Mm -hmm. What did your parents do? My father worked for the Public Works Department. In Natick? In Natick. And did he grow up in Natick also? Yes. What was his name? His name was Robert, same as mine. I'm a junior. Um, and your mother? Uh, well, she was kind of a, a housekeeper originally. In other homes? No, her own. Mm -hmm. And did you have brothers and sisters? Yep, one brother and one sister. Do you remember Natick being a happy time growing up? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I, I don't know what anybody else did, but I did. What were some of the things you remember in your teen years? Well, uh, school mostly, but uh, during your time off, uh, swimming in Jennings Pond, uh, fishing in Jennings Pond, and skating. One of the things that, speaking about skating, it brings to mind on the other side of Jennings's Pond, there's a small marshy area and there's a brook that used to feed Jennings's Pond. Well that used to freeze over, but it used to freeze over very thin and we used to try to skate it without going through. And as you skated, the ice was going like that. None of us actually fell in, but if we did it was very shallow. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, taking risks. <laughs> now what elementary school did you go to? Uh, the East Native School. And then uh, the South Native School, uh, the fifth and sixth grade, in the old wooden building down there. Down in South Natick. In South Natick, mm -hmm. yeah. And then high school? No high school. Junior high school, graduated ninth grade, could have gone on to high school, but I didn't want to. And what did you do after ninth grade? I uh, worked. Where? I worked on a, a truck farm in Dover. And from there I went to work at uh, the Whipple Company. I was a, an assistant cook on the third floor. And the Whipple Company is still in existence today. Yes, it is. Grandmother's Mince Meat? Grandmother's Mince mm -hmm. Meat. How long did you work there? Uh, maybe about a year or so. And then what? And then I went to work for uh, a home maintenance in Wellesley driving trucks. And from there I went to work at uh, uh, a farm in Dover. And I worked on the farm in the morning, drove the, his truck all day, came back and worked on the farm again, went home at seven o'clock at night. And I went into the Marine Corps from there. And how old were you when you went into the Marines? Nineteen. You were nineteen In fact, years I hadn't even turned nineteen. Did you enlist or were you getting drafted? You enlisted. You enlisted. What made you decide at that point to go into the Marines? There was a friend of mine, Charlie Mullins, I used to chum with. And there was a Charlie Brady, Kenny Buell, and there's one other guy, and I can't remember his name. They decided to go into the Marine Corps. 
and Charlie and I were talking about it, and we figured we'd do the same thing. Charlie Brady and Kenny Buell were accepted sometime in March of 1942. Charlie and I went in. We had actually had to go into Boston. Went in sometime in late March and went through our physicals and I was told that they would accept me if I got three or four cavities in my teeth fixed and on the way out on the train I asked Charlie how he did and he was kind of quiet about the whole thing, he never said a word. So I came home, told my mother, and she called a dentist and he set up appointments after seven o'clock at night because I was still working and he fixed my teeth, it took him two weeks. And I said to him when he was finished, I said, send my mother a bill and I'll send money home and we'll pay it. And I went back in and they accepted me and they told me to report for duty on March 13th. I went in on March 13th by train. My mother and father saw me off. They accepted me. I went through a partial physical. They accepted me. They put me up in a, I told John this, a sleazy hotel next to the old Howard in Scully Square. And stayed overnight and on July 14th, they swore us in, put us on a train, and sent us to Paris Island. Why did you choose the Marines? I don't know. I haven't got a clue. <laughs> I figured just because the rest of the guys were going in mm -hmm. to the Marines, I'd go. And what about your friend? Charlie never made it. Uh, I heard later from my mother, and incidentally, she was kind of nice about this whole deal. She wrote to all of the guys that I knew all of the time that you were in the service. She wrote to your friends? Yep. And I found out later that Charlie had been drafted, and he was over in Europe, and he wound up driving trucks in the Red Ball Express. Explain what the Red Ball Express is. That was uh, when they were delivering goods from the coast inland, when they had penetrated the uh, Siegfried Lines and the Maginot Lines, and they were approaching the rivers in Germany. They had to run these trucks day and night in convoys, and they called it the Red Ball Express. And he made it out okay? Yes. I'll tell you a little bit about that later. Okay. And you had friends go in. You went to basic training where? Paris Island. Paris Island. How long did that last? I'm try I thought about it and thought about it. It was either nine weeks or 12. What was it like? Do you remember? <laughs> Sheer hell. Was it? Oh, yeah. When we uh, left the train, we boarded buses and went out to the island. And the first thing we heard out of everybody was, you'll be sorry. I mean, they really yelled it at us. That's <laughs> all. So we were. It took me about two days to get over the shock. I don't think it was homesickness, because I'd been away before. I don't know, I was feeling sorry for myself, maybe. In fact, that was one of the things that the drill instructor insisted on. You know, quit feeling sorry for yourself. Another thing he said was, we didn't ask you to join the Marine Corps. You volunteered. And now we've got you. So. And what time, what was a typical day like during your basic? Oh, um, you had to get up, get dressed, make your bunk, and then they would follow you out. And what time of morning would you be getting up? Probably about 6 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And you fell out, had, went through exercises, and then you were told to shave, and then you went to breakfast. From breakfast you came back and it was close to a drill. Right up until noontime. And they finally issued you your rifles. They told us, uh, John didn't go through this, but I did. They handed us our rifles, it was wrapped in heavy brown paper. Inside of that it was covered with cosmoline. 
And the only way you can get the Cosmoline off is wash it off with gasoline. And what is Cosmoline? I haven't got a clue. What, was it greasy? You could drop it in water and it wouldn't, nothing, water couldn't get to it. Okay. It was just a thick, heavy, hard Cosmoline. And we finished, you know, cleaned them up. And you were told to memorize your rifle's number. And that you would treat it like a woman and take care of it like a woman because some days it may save your life. And then, of course, the close order drill was with weapons after that. It was just constant, constant. And after t basic training, did you have any time off prior to your next stop at another no. camp? No, no. Finished basic, basic training. One of the things that I want to uh, say was. While we were down there, they marched five or six platoons into this auditorium. A platoon consisted of about 50 guys. And there was a, a person up on the stage, they handed you a sheet of paper, said, put your name on it, and it had numbers on it, one to a hundred. Said, we're gonna send you code. It's called Morse code. We'll send you two characters. If they sound the same, put yes. If they don't sound the same, put no. Go through the hundred. Of course, I didn't have a clue of what we were doing, but that saved my bacon. When we graduated, when we finished Paris Island, they fell us out for our assignments. And they named off the guys that were going to go to sea duties, some were going to the infantry, some were going to cooks and bakers, and Dowie and Dunbar. You're headed for Quantico, Virginia. And Dowie said to me, he said, that's where they train Marine officers. I said, well, we're not officer material. So that's where we wound up, learning radio, Morse code, and naval procedure and communications. And the pressure there was even worse than it was at Paris Island. Why? It, it was school from 7.30 in the morning till 12 noon, from 1 until 5, and from 6 until 9, every day except Saturday and Sundays. The pressure was so bad that at least two men in one of the buildings committed suicide. During that period of yep. time, before even going over? Yep. How did, how did you all find time to get any kind of relief from that pressure? There was no relief. No, the pressure was kept right on constantly. Were you learning Morse code at mm -hmm. that point? So you were going to be the radio operator? Yes. And did you know it at that no. time? No. Not a clue. So how long did that last? We graduated from there, and then we were transferred to uh, Hadnot Point, which was a brand new base, all beautiful you know, buildings. And we were transferred there to uh, do a lot of field work, setting up base radios and learning the, the radios that's carried on your back. The pressure there wasn't that bad. It was mostly all field work and working with officers and what was expected of you. Did you feel at that point in time a comfort level working with officers or was there intimidation at all? What was it like? I don't know. I think I'm the type of person that would be comfortable no matter what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it didn't bother me any. Mm -hmm. And how did the officers treat you and the other men? Well, most of them they were on the basis uh, they were really looked down on you a little bit. Uh, the officers that I met later on uh, in combat it was a different breed of person altogether. A lot of them were graduates from Annapolis that went into the Marine Corps and become line officers. And, and they were uh, princes, top shelf. Mm -hmm. So after a little more communications and field work. When did you know that you were going to be sent overseas? Not then. Mm -hmm. We had, uh, they gave us a five-day furlough. Took us two days to get home, 
one day there and two days to get back. In fact, when we started out, we uh, were on a bus headed towards a railroad station. I can't, can't remember which one it was, but as soon as we started out, fog rolled in, the bus driver wouldn't drive. So we told him that we can't stop. So we said if two or three of the Marines ran out in front of the bus at the, just the very edge of the headlight beams, would he keep going? He said he would. So we did it. In relays, we finally got to the railroad station and boarded the trains and came on. And you had a day at home? A day at home. Were you serious with a girl at that point in time? No. Mm -hmm. What was it like saying goodbye to your parents and your family? What was that? What was it like when you had to say goodbye to your family? It didn't seem to bother me. Eh? Mm -hmm. Like I say, I'd been away before. Mm -hmm. And no, it, it really didn't bother me. And then after you left Natick, where did you go to? Tent City had not point. Tent which, City. Tent City, which is a, uh, actually there was barracks there too, but they weren't as good as they were at Hadnoy Point. And where was Hadnoy Point? Hadnoy, North Carolina. North Carolina, thank you. And I was assigned to a, a platoon, and I chummed around with the corporal that was the head of the platoon. And one morning when we fell out, they asked for, I can't remember now, it was 12, 13, or 14 volunteers to go overseas immediately. And I stepped forward, and they weren't kidding when they said immediately. They gave me less than a half an hour to pack my sea bag, board a train, and I was on my way to California. Arrived in California, got off of the train, boarded a bus, went to a naval base, and boarded the naval troop transport. And I was on my way out of there. So you had gone in in March of 42. So what month was this that you were going overseas? I really can't remember. I had the furlough in December. Okay, so it was 43. Sometime, figure, figure sometime between January, February, or March, somewhere in there. In 43? Yep. And how long were you at sea? Uh, I can't remember that. One of the things I do remember was up, I was up on deck once and I noticed the light flashing off in the distance towards us. So I pulled out a little pad and started to write it down because it was in Morse code. And some nitwit sergeant rushed up and he grabbed me and he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm copying the code. He said, you're not supposed to be doing that. And he took the pencil and paper away from me. And he says, you keep it up yourself, put you on report. Of course, I didn't understand what they were sending. It was all in code. They sent it in five letter groups, a space, five letter groups. And then, of course, they turn it into communication centers and they break it down. Turned out later it was a submarine, a US submarine that was signaling us. We landed at uh, American Samoa sailed into this beautiful harbor. The thing I noticed most was a huge mountain on the right-hand side, all green. And that was the first time I saw a landing craft. We disembarked from the transport to a landing craft and onto trucks and out to the middle of the island somewhere. I'm not the middle, on, actually on the coast, way out in the middle, in the island. And I found out that I was going to be trained as a machine gunner. So I went through a very rigorous training with machine guns, water-cooled, air-cooled 30 calibers, and 50 calibers. Learned how to fire them, load them, break them down, set them up. And one morning, about, I don't know, but maybe about three weeks into this training, or four weeks into it, the lieutenant comes up to the, the little building that we were in, he bellows done by, get out here. So I went out, and he says, why in the James Christ didn't you tell me that you were a radio specialist? He said, we just wasted all this machine gun training on you. I said, no, you haven't. I said, it's all up here. I'll remember it. He said, well, I can't keep you in this outfit, and there's no radios around. So he says, I'll assign you to a telephone company. So I started learning all about telephones, running wire, 
hooking up phones, setting up switchboards. Did you ever get a sense of frustration at all because you were learning all these different things? No. Was it your youth that was? I think it was my youth. Mm -hmm. And not only that, like I say, I, I would feel comfortable no matter where I was, mm -hmm. except being a, a cook, I guess. So and, you're learning telephones now. Yeah, and I get to work with a redhead from Pennsylvania named Red Walsh, and we're stringing wire all over America and Samoa. One day, you climb up coconut trees. You know, you have those spikes in your, and you climb up coconut trees, you carry the wire up with you, and you tie it onto the coconut tree, and then Red would pull it up. And one day we heard this siren going off, and I yelled at Red, I said, what the hell's a police car is doing out here? And he says, I don't know. So he pulled the wire up and tied it on. It's a good thing he did, because the light tank comes screaming right out of the woods. And if they'd have hooked that wire, both of us would have been yanked right out of those trees. And whenever they're running those tanks, they have to use their sirens. Except, of course, in combat. But. Mm -hmm. What was the weather like in Samoa? Uh, between 11 and 1 o'clock, it poured. I mean, really rained. Every day. And then the sun would pop out about 1.30, 2 o'clock. And how hot would it get? Oh, 90, most of the time. Did the heat bother any of you? No. No, the heat doesn't bother me at all. Mm -hmm. What was going on in and around Samoa, on the other islands? Were you hearing anything about? No, not a thing. Mm -hmm. I guess they were just using American Samoa as a training base. And how long were you there for? Well, maybe about a month at the most. And then what? And then we boarded a, uh, a luxury liner called the Lorelei. And we had our own, what do you call them, staterooms, cabins? Mm -hmm. And there was four of us to a cabin. Had your own bathroom, showers, and the food was super, absolutely super. Went through a typhoon, and we landed at, uh, docked at uh, Auckland, New Zealand, and unloaded lumber, and from there we went off to Australia and landed at uh, Melbourne, Australia. What was happening in Australia? Not much of anything. I guess they figured that the 1st Marine Division saved them from the Japanese, which they did when they stopped them at... Now, were you with the 1st Marine Division at that, that point in time? I was assigned time? to the 1st Marine Division. At that point were yes. you assigned? Okay. Yeah. So you're in Australia, Melbourne. Is this your first time in that area? Yep, and they put us up, I love this, in a cricket grounds. And it was in there dead of winter. No heat. When you went to bed, you wore your winter greens, your winter overcoat, your gloves, and your hat. The only thing you took off was your shoes. We stayed there for three days, and they put us on trains, and we went out to Mount Martha, which is the extreme southern tip of Australia. And I was assigned to, well, Mount Martha was a small town, about the, smaller than the size of Natick. We boarded a bus and went out to uh, the camp that they had set up for us. We got there late at night, and we hadn't had any food for since breakfast. So when we landed, we put our gear away. The lieutenant came out and said, anybody that's hungry, go over the other side of the hill. There's a CB unit over there. They serve food all the time. So we went over, and I was standing in the food line. And just for kicks, I said, anybody from Massachusetts? And I got a yo. And they said, anybody from Boston? I got a yo. I says, how about outside of Boston? I got a yo. Two guys from Natick. One was Gubby Amoroso, and the other one was Zico. They were both in the Seabees, and they were attached to the first. They were actually on Guadalcanal. 
they were the ones that built the air, you know, the, the airfield. Mm -hmm. So I got to meet a couple of guys there. Was it a happy reunion? Do you remember that? Oh, was yeah. it one of disbelief? What, what was it like meeting friends? Yeah, because see, I knew, my father knew most of the Amorosas. He worked with an Amorosa, Len Amorosa. He was a mechanic at the Public Works Department. So he knew them, and I knew Len, and of course the minute I heard Gubby Amoroso, you know, I figured Small what the heck. world. Yeah. Mm. How long a time did you get to spend with them? Just that evening? Well, just off and on. Mm -hmm. We would see each other and talk. Mm -hmm. So you're in this area. And I was, actually I was assigned to the Marine Engineers at that time. They eventually dissolved the unit. Why? Well, I guess they figured they really didn't need marine engineers. That's where I learned all about explosives. <laughs> you know, how to handle them and things like that. Mm -hmm. And how long were you with them? I was with them until we went into uh, Cape Gloucester. Do you know how to spell that? No. Okay. And where was that? That was in uh, off the New, New Guinea coast. Okay. How did you get there? By uh, LST. And explain what an LST is. Large slow target. <laughs> <laughs> no, they carry tanks and trucks, and they can drive these or run them right up onto a beach. What they do is they drop two sea anchors off. And when the sea anchors are catching, they run cables. And they just run the cables out and they run these LSTs right up on the beach. And they open two doors and a ramp drops down. And then they can drive the trucks and tanks and everything right off onto supposedly dry land. And sometimes you would miss dry land or arrive well, short? Yeah, well, sometimes they, you know, the beaches were, weren't shallow or they were shallow enough and they would, of course, wind up maybe 10 or 15 yards off the beach and you had to go through water to get to the shore. Mm -hmm. And were you in an area that was safe to get on shore? No. No, it was, uh, I was uh, the second landing after the first landing. And this was uh, out and out right jungle. I mean, it was just the worst place in the world that you could ever want to be. It was muddy, trucks got stuck, tractors got stuck, and finally when they broke out of the swampy area onto uh, where the airfield was, in fact the roads, they had to cut down logs and just put down logs so that they could go anywhere with them. And they had to set up uh, uh, desalinization units. This was one of the engineers that I was working with. They set up these desalinization units to make fresh water so that everybody would have fresh water. Uh, that's where I almost lost my feet. We had these so-called combat boots. They were rubber-soled and a little bit of rubber top and then they were canvas. And of course everything was soaking wet constantly. Everything rotted. Nothing was safe. Was it because of rain? Rain a lot of and rain. the humidity mm -hmm. and the heat. Mm -hmm. it, it finally was, you know, better when we finally got out to the airfields where it was dry. What about sickness or illness with the men? Did that happen? Well, th th there was a lot of uh, sicknesses. Like I say, I almost lost my feet. I finally took these idiot combat boots off and I saw how my, you know how you, you get real wrinkly mm -hmm. when you're wet constantly? Mm -hmm. This was even worse than this. This had gone beyond that stages. And I finally took them off and I threw those away and got my feet dry, got dry socks on, and then I put on my combat shoes. And I was fine after that. And one of the things that, uh, that I found out later uh, one of the units that was leapfrogging up the island, try to catch the Japanese and cut them off, wound up be a friend of mine who was from Natick. His name was Joe Gibbs. 
he had joined the Marine Corps well before, I think, the rest of us. I think he may have gone in in, in January. And I also found out later when I was working for Jimmy Bell that one of the officers that was on those landings was a friend of Jimmy Bell's. He graduated from Bowdoin College with Jimmy. Jimmy Bell being from Natick also. Yes. Mm -hmm. And not only that, I was working the, the night shift radios, communicating with these people as they leapfrogged up the island, which I, I didn't find out until later, because 90% of it was all code work. You never knew who you were talking with. Mm -hmm. so. so at this point, you are the radio operator? Yes. And when you talk about, explain leapfrogging. This is something others have used too, but explain that whole concept. Well, the, the landing was on the, the tip end of the island. And this is New Guinea? No, this no? is Cape Gloucester. Cape Gloucester, okay. It's, it's right across the bay from New Guinea. Okay. And the island was pointed. We landed on the island and we went up and took the airfields, but they tried to trap the Japanese trying to get away from us. So they would send small landing crafts with the LCTs, which is a landing ship tank, and they could actually put one single tank in there. And they would use this tank firing a 75 millimeter gun over the, the bow of the ship when they were going to go into land. They would plaster the beachhead with that, and then they would land. They never had any opposition at all. They just never caught up with the Japanese. Except once, they caught up with a group of them that they had, uh, the Japanese had abandoned. They were uh, wounded and sick and dying, so they just left them. And when the Marines caught up with that group, what did they do with them? Do you really want to hear? Yes. They killed them all, shot them. They did? Yes. Was it? In, in looking back at that, was it because they were ill and wouldn't have made it, or was it because they were the enemy and this was it war? It was the enemy and they were retaliating because of what the Japanese did to, to the Marines on Guadalcanal. And t talk a little bit about that Guadalcanal issue. Well, I really wasn't on it, mm -hmm. but I just, I knew most of the guys. When I got to, I mean, to uh, Australia, all of the guys that had been on Guadalcanal were there. and. They told about how the Japanese mistreated the Americans when they captured them, how they, you know, slaughtered them. Mm -hmm. And they just figured, well, if this is the way they're going to play, we'll play the same way. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were with your unit, how many were in your group with you? It was almost like a headquarters company. Uh, clerks, bakers, mechanics, radio personnel, telephone personnel, uh, and heavy mortars, which is an 80 millimeter mortar. That was a, what your headquarters company was made up of. And your officers would be with you? Yes. So you're on this Cape Gloucester. Right. And the Japanese are on that small island also. Right. And were you in combat with them almost from the very beginning? Right, from the very start. What was that it's, like for you? It really wasn't that bad for me on Cape Gloucester. This was almost like a, well, there was people killed there and wounded there. You know, one of the things, they couldn't even bury the dead. It was so bad. They couldn't dig down into the ground because of the roots and stuff. And, I mean, it was really, really a miserable place to be. How long were you there? Not that long. It didn't take us that long to, you know, to take care of the thing. One of the things I wanted to mention was, uh, one morning I was standing there looking at my shoes, and I noticed that I pitched forward, almost like about so. And just before I was ready to fall flat in my face, I went this way. And I said to myself, what in the Sam Hill was going on? And somebody screamed, earthquake. There's an active volcano on the island. And we went through a small earthquake. 
So in the middle of a war, you also had to deal with yes. typhoons and earthquakes. Yep. <laughs> Were there any injuries from no, that? No, no, it wasn't oh, that God. long. Maybe it was a, uh, less than a two or three second tremor. And then we looked up and you could see the smoke coming out of the top of the mountain. So how long were you on that island? Not very long. I can't remember. Weeks? Days? Oh, no. Figure a month. A month? Yeah. Okay. And then what happened? And then we went back to an island called the Russell Islands. We didn't stay there very long. We went from there up to Goodenough Island, which was another landing. But it was a, uh, uh, let's see, not the first wave, it was the second wave landing. And it really didn't amount to anything. I think we caught the Japanese really by surprise on this one. And they wanted this island for the uh, aircraft runway. In fact, if you look on the back of my discharge, you'll see that it was, you know, Cape Colossa, Good Enough Island. And then we went to uh, New Guinea. That was a second wave landing, and that was really nothing. It was almost like a, uh, uh, a backup unit to the Army. And when you mention second wave landings, does that mean you're the second tr group of troops going in? Yes. So is it, I don't want to assume, but is it an assumption that the first wave going in has the most difficult time? First, second, third, okay. and maybe the fourth. Mm -hmm. So you'd have... In fact, almost like at Pelilo, the second wave caught it more than the first wave. And were you on the second wave of first that? First wave. You were. And Pelilu is where? Uh, right on the equator, mm -hmm. about 500 miles from uh, the Philippines. Now between New Guinea and Peleliu? We went on maneuvers, you know, and brought the division back up to strength, and then we went up to, uh, to Peleliu. Now when you mentioned bringing the division up to strength, would that mean you had a rest, but also they brought in fresh, fresh troops? troops? Because? And, well, because of the people that were killed, or mm -hmm. sickness, uh, mostly I think well, there's quite a few people killed, wounded, on any one of those three operations, Cape Gloucester, uh, Goodenough Island, and New Guinea. Uh, and the Marine Division runs at about 20 to 22,000 men, which is kind of a streamlined division, not like an Army division. You have an Army Infantry Division, you have an Army Artillery Division, but the Marines, everything was incorporated in the division. They had its own artillery, its own tanks, things like that. Mm -hmm. They had uh, three infantry regiments. And how many would be in a regiment? Uh, figure roughly about between 800 and 900 men. You have A, B, C companies. Mm -hmm. That would be one regiment and on up the, the alphabet. You would have a headquarters company for the 1st Battalion, a headquarters company for 2nd Battalion, and so on. Mm -hmm. I was attached to the 1st uh, Battalion, headquarters company, 5th Marines, when I went up to Peleliu. Peleliu has some history. Do you want to share some of that with us? Well, you saw the... Uh, the photographs of the landing on the beach. I was on the first wave, we went in on Amtrak's, and I was a radio man. Carried a, no, telephone man, telephone man. They switched me from radio to telephone. We landed, and it was just sheer hell on that beach. I mean, people were getting killed all around us. And the amphibian tractors were getting hit with anti-tank weapons and mortars were falling all around us, and everybody finally decided we'd make it, get off of the beach and inland. And inland was probably about, maybe a little bit wider than the width of this room from the, from the water to the edge of the airfield. And we set up a, uh, a switchboard, and 
the communications officer ordered me to uh, take a spool of wire, field wire, and another guy, and go out to find a company, which was on our left, and we finally found a company. The uh, first lieutenant, second lieutenant, was in kind of a bomb crater. We set up the telephone, and we have to wait or stay there to make sure that nothing happens to the wire going back and forth. So we stayed with the uh, company commander, and about noontime, a call came in to the field phone for the two of us to report back. Just as we started back, the Japanese pulled a tank attack. The two tanks coming right towards us. So the two of us dove into this bomb crater, and there was a Navy lieutenant and a radio man that was controlling naval gunfire. And one tank drove right past us, about where your camera is and swung to their right. It went between a, a bunch of bushes and the uh, A Company's bomb crater. The other tank swung right, his right, and there was two Japanese soldiers on the back of the tank, and I had a Tommy gun at the time, and I cocked a Tommy gun, and I got up and I was ready to, not standing up, but just up, and ready to shoot the two of them off the back of the tank when the lieutenant screamed at me, don't you dare fire. He says, you'll draw the tanks fire. I said to myself, they won't know where these bullets are coming from. But I stopped anyway. And we turned and we watched the other tank that went between A Company and these bushes. And there was a Sherman tank packed in the bushes. And all we saw, everything just seemed to, sh no noise. It just stopped. And we watched the muzzle of that Sherman tank come out of the bushes, and the tank, Japanese tank, was about from here to you, and they fired. And that turret of that tank went screaming up into the air, and it blew a Japanese soldier right out through the side of the tank, and a huge piece of the tread went sailing right over our heads. Do you remember what you were feeling like personally at that point in time? I don't think I had any feelings. None. I don't even know whether I was stunned or there wasn't any panic. I think the panic started when I saw the tanks coming towards us. Mm -hmm. And then when I got into the crater, the, the panic stopped. And then of course everything stopped. We just stopped their whole attack and we went back to uh, headquarters. And that's when they ordered us to go back out to A Company and they were going to attack the airfield in the morning, the next morning, and that's when we were to go across the airfield. We're going to take a break one minute. The sun is shifting, so we're going to shift the um, chair, if you just wait one moment. Okay. So you were asked then, or commanded to go back to A Company? Yes. We took a spool of wire with us. We were going to hook up our wire to where the phone was at A Company and continue on from there out into the airfield when they attacked the airfield. We got about a third of the way out into the airfield and we just ran right into a tremendous artillery barrage. And I said to the kid that was with me, I said, we can't be this important <laughs> that they're after us. And machine gun bullets were going all around us. You could actually hear them. You could see them hitting the dirt. So I said to him, I said, we're not going any further. If there's a crater around here somewhere, we're going to drop into it and we'll call back. And I said, besides that, we're running out of wire. We'll never get across the field there. So we dropped into this bomb crater, hooked up a phone, I called back. And they said, OK, when it quiets down a little bit, come back. And I found out the reason for this tremendous artillery barrage was the Marines had set up a 105 millimeter unit, artillery unit, right on the very edge of the airfield, and the Japanese were after them. 
and they were right behind us. So we finally got back to the command post, and I asked for two spools of combat wire. I knew the combat wire would get us across. So we finally got across, and we're running across this airfield, and right in front of us was a Japanese machine gun with three Japanese soldiers dead around it. And I said, that had to be one of the guys that was shooting at us. We finally found A Company, hooked up the phone again, and it, everything seems to be a blur after that. I can't remember too much of anything, except I was chumming around with a, a guy from Texas, Bascom's H. Murphy. Uh, in fact, I've got a photograph of him. The, the next thing that we had to do was uh, the communications officer told me to run a com uh, not a combat wire, but a, a field wire across this causeway out to a, uh, a ridge, a combat, a ridge that was actually in combat. So we took off across this causeway, and we finally, just as we were going across the causeway, they started to bomb the opposite side of these ridges with the uh, Marine Corsairs. They would take off from the airfield with a 2,000 pound bomb underneath it, come in low, drop the bomb, and it would skip up this alleyway and hit the hills up inside of it. We finally got the wire up to uh, the company and the officer said, you know, it's really too bad you brought it up here. He says, we've been pulled off of the ridge. So he says, you, you know, you can come back with us. So I says, okay. And this was supposedly a company. We're talking 280 men. I think about 40 men came down off of that hill. Only 40? Only 40. He says, over the past two weeks, he says, we've lost all of these men, wounded and killed. We finally got back to the communications base, and the next morning, the guys that were guarding the causeway shot two Japanese soldiers cutting the communications wire with a pair of scissors. And of course, you can't cut this wire with scissors. It has a tremendous heavy coat on the outside. When you hook it up, you have to crush that to get at the wire inside. And there's four copper wires inside of it, plus two steel wires inside of it. How thick would it be, all wrapped? Oh, a good quarter of an inch, maybe a little bit larger than a quarter mm -hmm. of an inch. The combat wire was extremely thin, mm -hmm. less than roughly about a sixteenth of an inch in diameter. And from there, we were ordered to go to the northern tip of Peleliu to take over from an army unit. And we had to march up, you get a chuckle out of this, we had to march up on a road and the army came back in trucks. And of course the Marines always kind of teased the army a little bit. One of the Marines barked at them like a dog. And one of the guys on the army truck says, you ought to bark like a dog, you live like a dog. <laughs> So even in war, there was... Oh, God, tell me about it. If we could steal anything from those people, we would steal it. Beg, borrow, or steal. I mean, when it comes to equipment, the Army was loaded with it, and we were kind of the, uh, the orphans of the Navy. And if there was any money left, we got it. We got to the northern end of the island, ran right into a tremendous artillery barrage. The shells were going off all around us. And Murphy was with me, he said, what are we going to do, Dunbar? I said, we're digging holes. So we started digging, you should have seen two guys throw dirt so fast. It finally got down low enough. I mean, the stuff was exploding in the trees. And a lieutenant, <laughs> finally it, it let up a little bit. And a lieutenant came over and he says, Dunbar, I want you to run a wire up to one of the companies up in the ridges. This was at night. You couldn't see a hand out here. 
So he says, okay, Murphy, you go with me. He said, Dunbar, don't you volunteer me for this stuff. So the two of us took off, and the lieutenant says, I said to him, I said, where are they? He said, they're up there in the ridge or somewhere. I said, wonderful. So we took off, climbed up into the ridges, and we finally found the company. And they had located this field piece that was firing at the Marines down below. And we hooked up the phone for them. And I said to him, I said, we're not staying here. And he says, yes, you are. You're not going anywhere. Front lines again. And they finally knocked out the gun, the field piece. And he says, okay, now you can go back. And Murphy said to me, he says, how are we going to get back? And I said, we follow the wire back, Murphy. So that's how we got back to the base, you know, the headquarters. So you were actually able to maintain a sense of humor in very, very humorless conditions. More or less. <laughs> and Peleliu has recently been part of the World War II programs that we see on our PBS channels when they're, when they're showing actual footage. Is my understanding that you are in that footage? Yes. When we started to go across the airfield, evidently the f combat photographer caught us just as we started to take off across the field. So how long were you on Peleliu? I think it was just about a month. I'd have to go through that book that I have, but it, it, it didn't last that long. It was, it was really out and outright furious. You know, constantly furious. Never let up until they finally declared the place so-called secure. It never was secure. The Army came in after that, and they sent us back to the Russell Islands. It's called Pavuvu. 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 And they said the base would be all ready for us. And when we got there, Pavuvu is nothing but coral. And when it rained, the stuff would turn right, just like it was snow. In fact, the streets, they would bulldoze the streets, and the coral would roll out, and they would have bankings of coral up alongside the street. And between the coconut trees, they had set up tents. I think they call them pyramidal. Yeah. I can't think of the word. But it sleeps eight guys. It had wooden floors, and it was a pretty good sized tent. But the uh, so called streets between the tents was mud. So they decided there was only one way to get the coral on these streets was to form a bucket brigade. From the main street, we carried coral and dumped it on these, you know, these streets between the tents. To help get the mud covered? Yeah. And what was, so it was obviously rainy there oh, also. Oh, yeah, it was rainy, but not as bad as it was at uh, Cape Colossa. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think this island was owned by Colgate. Mm -hmm. They used evidently the coconut oil or palm oil. When you were on P Pavuvu, Pavuvu, I'm sorry. When you were on Pavuvu, was this also in combat, or was this no, no, no. a little this relaxation a, for supposedly you? Supposedly a rest and rehab area where they built the, the division back up again, mm -hmm. and they had a small airfield. In fact, the main road was the airfield, mm -hmm. uh, and I was assigned to telephone duty again, and I was stringing wire most of the time. Uh, one of the times I was stringing wire, I went across the street and I noticed a lieutenant and a bulldozer and two or three guys wrestling with coconut logs. And every time I climbed up into a coconut tree and strung the wire and I kept looking down at them. I noticed every time they, they hooked a cable on the coconut logs, it would slip off. So I finally climbed down out of the tree and I walked across the thing and I said to the lieutenant, can I help? And he says, yeah. And he says, I'll show you how to take care of those coconut logs. So I took the cable, and I showed him how to put a timber hitch on the, the logs. And with the timber hitch, 
when you pull on it, the heavier the load, the tighter the cable gets. So the bulldozer started to move the cable, I mean the, the, the logs, and the lieutenant says, show me how to do it. And he says, where did you learn this anyway? I says, first year Boy Scouts. <laughs> and left him. <laughs> so how long were you in the Russell Island area? That's a blur. Okay. But we trained. Uh, they shifted me back over to a radio, and I would go with units, and they would attack uh, uh, so-called enemy bunkers. And that's where I first got an experience with a bazooka and how they used them. And you actually, when you're carrying the radio, you stay right with the, the commanding officer, which was usually a lieutenant, a first lieutenant. And you just worked with him. What was the bazooka like? Uh, loud and dangerous. <laughs> Were they large pieces of machinery? No. Uh, you see your coffee cup? Mm -hmm. It was about the diameter of that. I think about maybe three or four inches. And you had the guy that had it on his shoulder, he could sight it, and the man that loaded it would load it in and he would put two wires on a, the triggering device and he would pat him on the back and roll off to one side and when he pulled a the trigger, there was a huge blast would come out the back end of it, and of course the rocket would shoot forward. And that's how they would take out bunkers. Would One they? of the, go ahead. Go ahead. One of the nicest things on that island that happened. Uh, one day the lieutenant called me out and he says, I've got some duty for you. He said, we're sending you over to an island where the engineers have discovered hardwood. He said, you take your radio with you. The engineers are going to set up a sawmill on this island. And your job is to be, is to call in the orders from the engineers. They would call the engineers and say, we need X number of two by fours, planks and boards and stuff like that. And you tell the lieutenant over there what they, what they need. He saws it up. And the only thing you have to do is work from five o'clock in the afternoon to maybe about eight or nine o'clock at night. He said, the rest of the time is yours. So I'd ask the lieutenant if I could, you know, kind of nose around and go out with the guys who were cutting down the trees and work with the sawmill. And you know how we have chainsaws today? Mm -hmm. They had chainsaws back then. They did. But they were air driven. They had these huge trucks with compressors on them. And all of these chainsaws were actually driven by air, compressed air. So was this sort of a relief time for you because Absolutely. you weren't? And how long were you able to be in that area? I was there for maybe about two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then they sent somebody else out there. But I mean, uh, it was a good time on Pavumo. We had beer rations, which I never drank. I sold mine. <laughs> uh, and we had a theater. We called it the Pavuvu Gaiety. It was open air. You sat on coconut logs, and of course they had a big screen, and they would show films. And I love to listen to those guys talk to the people on the screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All the comments. Were you able at that time to write home? Always. You did? Yeah. Probably maybe twice a week. You couldn't tell them anything. Right. So it was always, hi mom, everything's fine, you know. The and, weather was either good or bad. And other than watching films on the screen or some drinking beer, when you had free time, what else would you do in your free time? Well, I play volleyball. Mm -hmm. And another thing that <clears throat> kind of aggravated me a little bit was whenever the lieutenant would set up a code practice session so that the guys could, you know, kind of keep their code speeds up. Dunbar was the one that had to transmit it all the time. And I said to him, I said, why? He says, you've got a beautiful fist. He says, everybody can understand the code that you send. I said, wonderful, I don't get to listen. <laughs> I have to send. So, so after Povavu, what happened? Then we headed for Okinawa. 
Okinawa. Of course, we didn't know it was Okinawa then. Okay. We were loaded aboard LSTs, large, slow targets. <laughs> and here's another thing that I had a chance to do was where I was in communications. I asked the uh, communications officer if I could go up on the communications bridge and work with the sailors up there, working with their signal flags and with their, their lights. So I would go up every day and they would use these uh, signals to signal the different ships. And I found out later that I was on the ship that had the commander of the entire organization. And they would send up flags, execute a left turn, a 90 degree left turn, or a 45 degree left turn. And then you would run up the flags, execute. And I got to uh, read the ship's identification book. Everything was all numbered. And you would just look up a number and you'd find the name of the ship. We finally wound up in Ulithage, which was a huge anchorage. All of the Navy ships would anchor there. We were anchored, and I was on the bridge, the signal bridge, and this line of ships came in. The USS Franklin, that was the one that had been damaged so badly, and they saved it. The light cruiser Santa Fe came in, and a kid by the name of Jay Borgs was assigned to that ship when we were at Paris Island. And the next ship that came in was the Wasp, an aircraft carrier. And I had just gotten a letter from Charlie Brady that he was aboard the Wasp. So when I found out that it was the Wasp, I went screaming down into the Admiral's quarters. You're supposed to knock and ask permission to enter. I kind of burst into the room. And here's all these officers sitting around drinking. And I said, I'm sorry, but I just found out that a friend of mine that I haven't seen since 1942, this was 1945, lived in the same town with me, and he's aboard the Wasp, and I would love to get over and see him. So the commander said, permission granted, and he says, you can take my gig over. Only commanders ride in gigs. I went over to the side, and of course these sailors are down there, and here's this, maybe I shouldn't say it. You can say it. Raggedy ass Marine standing there. They're expecting an admiral, and I climbed down into the thing, and I told him where I was supposed to go, and he says, don't worry, we've already got the orders. We went over to the wasp, and I climbed up this long ladder, and the officer of the deck he didn't know whether to salute or what. So I saluted him and I saluted the back of the ship and I told him why I was there. And he says, I'll give you a runner and they'll find Charlie for you. It took him a half an hour. We finally located Charlie and we sat around and talked for a while. And they had taken a 500 pound bomb hit right into the Marines compartment. And I said to Charlie, he says, anybody hurt? And he said, no, everybody was up on deck. And you should have seen the shrapnel through that ship. It penetrated a lot of the bulkheads and stuff. And so I said to Charlie, he says, you would never ever catch me on one of these fire traps. He says, Bob, I don't envy you where you're gonna go. He says, you're headed for Okinawa. And they just came back from there. They had bombed Japan, and that's where the Franklin had got hit, and they had shelled and bombed Okinawa. So I finally got back to the LST and then we left and headed for Okinawa. Charlie was a Natick. Natick, he was the one that joined in March. And when he came back, he stayed in Natick? Yes. We chummed around for a little while. Mm -hmm. And he married a girl named Jean. I don't know what her last name was. Mm -hmm. And he ran a, uh, well, first he was a mechanic at a Oldsmobile dealership in Wellesley. Mm -hmm. And then he finally got his own gas station over in Kachuswa. Mm -hmm. 
So was th his comment to you the first time you had actually heard that you were going to Okinawa? Yes. Do you remember how you felt about that? No. Mm. I looked at it maybe just as another, another landing. Of course, I didn't know where Okinawa was. I hadn't mm -hmm. got a clue. Mm -hmm. And we're off to Okinawa. And the landing was slated for April 1st. April Fool's Day, and I was assigned the first wave again, and we were loaded into these Amtraks, or water buffaloes. They opened the doors of the, oh, incidentally. We were headed, the ships of the line lined up parallel to the shoreline, and they would be shelling it. The LSTs would come in and head between these ships and head towards the shore. Japanese. Zero flew right over the top of the ship. Not a soul fired at him until he got over land, and then they started shooting at him. But then they opened the doors to the LST, dropped the ramp, and the water buffaloes went right out and down into the water. And this is where I kind of started to reflect a little bit. I said, This is your fifth one. You'll never, never make it. Or if you do make it, at worst, you'll be wounded. It was a piece of cake. Never even fired a shot at us. We got right across the island within the first two or three hours. And they captured a Japanese air, airfield to the left of us so quick that the Japanese pilots were landing to be refueled and rearmed. To their surprise, they weren't going anywhere after that. And of course, after that, then we swung south. And that's where we ran into the Japanese. On Okinawa, though? On Okinawa. The southern part of the island? Yep. They had set up a line. I think they called it, we called it the Shuri Line. The Shuri Castle was, was about midway, and the 5th Marines had the center of that. You had Army units. I can't remember the number of... There must have been at least two Marine divisions and maybe a couple of Army divisions. And that's, that's, that's where it all started, right there. And of course, rain and mud. And a lot of artillery. A lot of artillery. And not only that, but we had uh, the US Master, USS Massachusetts was supporting the 5th Marines. So they would be out in the harbor. Yep. We could actually see the ship. Having sensed when you were first coming on shore that this is it, you know, your fifth landing. landing and confrontation, and then you said it was a breeze, but now you're meeting up with the Japanese again. Did that sense come over you again? No, no, it didn't come over me at all. I, I think the... When I saw the landing at Pelilu, and you know what it really was, and how many people were killed and wounded on the island, and how many amphibian tractors that they had taken out, I think that's the picture that I got going in at Okinawa. You that know, you I, thought that would happen to you. Be the same thing, mm -hmm. you know. Are you a religious person? More or less. Were you then? Not really. I firmly believed in Jesus Christ. And I think that's as far as my religion went. I really believed in him and what he tried to do. It really blows my mind when I think that they crucified him. When you were going through all this, did you feel, though, that that you had luck, that you were quick on your feet. Was, what was it like knowing that all of these other combat Marines around you were falling and for some reason you made it through? Well, it wasn't because I was quick on my feet. <laughs> but it, it had to be something. And I keep thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. why did I get away with this? Why did I escape it? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I didn't even come down with malaria, no sicknesses, mm -hmm. no wounds, really. So you're in the southern section of Okinawa, and you're in combat again. You're getting covered by the USS Massachusetts. How long were you in that area of the island? Constantly. Constantly. And I was finally assigned to B Company, a radio man with B Company. And I was with the, uh, the first lieutenant all the time, right on the front lines. Not front, front lines, but close enough to them. So, you were on occasion with Murphy, your compatriot, but did you he, sense that they were, go ahead. Go ahead. Did, did you sense that you were really jumping from one commanding officer to another, that you really weren't with? Well, with, with radio communications, you're either put at a, uh, a stable station, mm -hmm. where you set up a, a pretty good sized communications unit or you were assigned to a, a company or the uh, battalion commander. Mm -hmm. And you carried an 80-pound radio on your back. And when I was with B Company, and the whole thing was kind of winding down a little bit, uh, we thought that the Japanese had used a gas shell on us because everybody started to get sick, but then they figured, you know, it might have just been some odd thing that had, you know, been fired. And I finally said to the, uh, the lieutenant, I said, the batteries in this thing are going to die, and I've got to get back to headquarters, get a new set of batteries, and I'll get a couple of pairs of socks. So he said, take off. He said, everything's quiet. So I started back, and I was walking down this road, and off to my right, I noticed a Japanese soldier waving his arms up in the air. He wanted to surrender. So I beckoned him to keep coming towards me, and I was carrying a carbine at the time, and he finally got somewhere near me, and two infantrymen came up, and I said, take this clown, you know, into headquarters. I said, I don't want anything to do with him. So they did, and I kept on going. Finally got to headquarters, changed the batteries. Oh, and while I was walking towards headquarters, off to my left, up on a, a small hill, I noticed a guy sitting in front of a pup tent. I said, God, he looks familiar. I said, on my way back, I'll take a chance and I'll stop. So coming back, I walked up the knoll, and there he was, Mr. Carey, Jerry Carey, the school teacher. From Natick. From Natick. And was he in the Army? Yes. No, Marines. Marines. He was a drill instructor at Paris Island at one time. And then he finally wound up over in Okinawa. Surprise, surprise. So how long did you visit with him? Just a few minutes, maybe 15, 20 minutes. And then I told him, I took off. So uh, from Company B back to headquarters, how long a Not very long, maybe about a 15 or 20 minute walk. Mm -hmm. So when you got back to Company B? That's when they started advancing again. And I stayed with Company B until, well, practically the end of it. They finally trapped the Japanese at the very tip end of the island. And I don't remember whether many of them surrendered. I know that the uh, uh, the uh, Japanese commander committed suicide, or harikari, or whatever they call it. So you weren't a part of that, you had just heard of that. Right. Were there a lot of prisoners taken? Some. Uh -huh. Oh, <laughs> I forgot. One of the things that, uh, when we came through the small village, I picked up a uh, beautiful silk kimono a full-length one, and we were somewhere near, not near the front lines, but they had started to bring civilians past us. And a girl, a civilian girl in the line spotted it, 
and she ran up to me and of course I couldn't understand what she was saying, but I gave it to her anyway. So she took off with the kimono. Do you think it was hers? No, mm -hmm. doubt it. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't speak English? No. Were they wary of you or? Didn't seem to bother this girl any. Mm -hmm. No, I think they, it, it, maybe the Japanese had told these people that we were, you know, barbarians and that we would, you know, kill them and slaughter them and, you know, so on. But of course, most of the Marines that ran across civilians, they were just as nice to them as they could possibly be. So judging from the beginning of your military career, 1942, now this is 1945. Yes. How, how much longer were you, down, were you in Okinawa? Right up until they, they the Japanese yeah. surrendered. And that was in? I can't remember. June? <laughs> yep, uh, June, July. May, June. So, somewhere, well, uh, didn't Germany surrender sometime in 45? Yes. In fact, we heard that the 5th Marines were the only units in the entire world that were in combat at that particular time. Everything else had stopped. stopped. So you were the last group yep. in combat. And, and, it, and it appears to me that you were in constant combat for a very long time. Not really. When you break it down, it might have been three weeks, four weeks at most. And then a except break. At, yeah, except at Pelito. Mm -hmm. Everybody on that island was in combat. Nobody was safe. There was no rear area that was safe. In fact, I wrote a letter to the, uh, the old breed, which I belong to. It's a Marine, uh, First Marine Division unit. I wrote them. Uh, they had an article in one of the uh, magazines or newsletters complaining about some of the men that were on the beach. And I wrote back and I says, what the hell difference does it make who these people were. Anybody that survived Pelilu without a wound or m mentally deserved better. And in all of this combat, were you ever wounded? No. No. You did have a little shrapnel. You Just did tell me shrapnel. that. Where did that occur? That was on Peleliu. On Peleliu. Yeah. Tell us about. Well, I think it was probably from small shell fragments. Tell us about the piece that was in your hand. Oh, you mean the piece that I took out? Mm. I think in 19, somewhere around 1965, 66, I got tired of it. I was an automobile mechanic, and I got tired of it hooking on things, so I finally cut it open with a razor blade and took a pair of pliers and pulled it out. So this is 20 years later? Yes, at least. And it was a small piece Just of? Just a small piece. Metal? Yes. So you're finishing up, literally, the end of the war was with your unit. They finally transferred me out of the, well, they, they had enough nerve to say, would you like to go to China with the 1st Marine Division? And I said, no way. This was sometime around October of 1945. So they transferred me out of there to an anti-aircraft unit that was breaking up. And this broke my heart. The lieutenant communication officer said to me, he said, I understand you've been a radio man. I said, yeah. And he said, well, we've got a lot of radio coming down here. He says, I want you to package it all up for shipment. So I went down, carefully packaged all of this beautiful radio equipment. And a truck pulled up, and it disappeared. And I found out later that they had dumped it in the end of the B-29 runway to extend the runway. They didn't really bring a whole lot back from over there. I found out years later from one of a friend of mine that on one of the islands where they had P-38s based, they dug this huge hole with bulldozers, pushed the P-38s into the hole, covered them with gasoline, and set them on fire, and buried them. 
Because they couldn't bring them back or well, wouldn't I, bring them back? They didn't want to bring them back. Mm -hmm. They didn't want the market flooded with planes, I guess, or mm -hmm. whatever. So in October of 45, you're finishing up, and where did they transfer you out? They to sent me to a ship and sent me home. How long were you at sea, do you remember? I haven't got a clue. Do you remember what you felt like coming home? No, I don't think there was any emotions. Mm -hmm. Where did you come into? California? San Diego. San Diego. And we landed, and of course when the sh ships came in from Europe, you know, they had bands there, and people were there waiting for them. Nothing when we landed, except a Salvation Army unit. They were there waiting for us, coffee and donuts. And I said to myself, if you ever make it, and you wind up with any kind of money at all, you're going to pay back to the Salvation Army. And have you? Yes. We get a check every month. Yeah, Freddie and I kind of hashed that one out. Freddie's the Tomcat. Freddie? Is the Tomcat. <laughs> <laughs> He's sitting there waiting for breakfast, and I said to him, Freddie, are we going to eat or are we going to send a check to the Salvation Army? <laughs> he lost. <laughs> <laughs> so after San Diego, were you able to relax at all in San Diego? or? We had Thanksgiving dinner there, and we got our orders that were being shipped back east for a 30-day furlough, starting December 1 and ending. I had to be back at the Philadelphia Navy Base on January the 3rd. And I want to mention the fact that while I was, oh, this comes later. I got home, spent the 30 days at home, dated a, a real special girl who was actually engaged to somebody else. And that was just a nice time to be with her. I had known her in school and went back to Philadelphia, the Naval Yard. And was assigned guard duty. We had to guard all the different outposts. And not only that, but we used to have to, uh, when people entered the base, we had to make sure that they weren't carrying anything, explosives or anything like that, because they were still building aircraft carriers there. And finally they gave us an exam. They had two corporal's rates to hand out. And you had to pass and this is what bugged me. When you're in communications, you have to pass the communications exam. The, they actually, actually asked me to pass the radio exams. They didn't say anything about telephone. But not only that, I had to pass everything that the infantrymen passed. In fact, I even had to drill a, plat a platoon in front of an officer. There was 150 of us took this exam I got one of the corporal's rates, and a friend of mine got the other corporal's rate. Now, is this at the end of your career that you're taking these exams? No, this is in January oh, okay. of 1946. And I was stationed there at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, and a friend of mine was dating a girl at uh, a hospital. And he said to me one day, he says, I always like to go on a blind date. And I said, doing what? And he <laughs> said, the nurses are graduating from this hospital. And he says, I've got you a date if you want to go. So I went. Oh, God. Was she ever beautiful? Off the shoulder, red gown, beautiful brown hair. I was thunderstruck. And I dated her every weekend that I possibly could. And a couple of experiences happened there that will blow your mind. I went out with three guys, and we were sitting in this bar, and we were drinking Tom Collins's. My limit is two. And I shut myself off, and I kind of liked the waitress that was there. So I said, I'm sticking around here. You guys take off. I woke up in her apartment. 
and I still don't know how I got there. And you think you only had two Tom Collinses? Well, that's what I think. <laughs> I think somebody slipped me a Mickey. Possibly. I think so. Yeah. And I came to her apartment, and I said to her, I said, does anything happen? She said, no. And I said, well, give me your name and address, and I'll get back to you, but I've got to get back to the base. This was maybe 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. So I finally got back to the base, and I never did, you know, get in touch with her again. I came, to, we went out another time. These are my friends, you know, with friends like this, you know, who needs enemies? We were out another time, and we got back to the base, okay, but I don't remember getting back. And I came to one morning, and all these guys are standing around laughing. So I says, okay, guys, what the hell is going on? They said, Bob, look at your crotch. I had on my white underpants, and there was a lip imprint <laughs> right on it. Maybe they put somebody up to that one, do you think? I don't know. <laughs> so you're in Philadelphia. How much longer did you have left in the service? Until July. Until July. Uh -huh. And in their infinite wisdom, they decided to send me and seven other guys out to California, San Diego. So we took a train across the states and wound up in San Diego. And we found out that we were going to fly out to an island called San Clemente, where they had targets set up and naval ships, brand new navy ships, would lay off the shore. And we set up a triangular system with radios and almost like a, uh, an engineer's uh, angle finder. Mm -hmm. And we would fire navy ships. We would take a reading on them, take a reading on the target, and they would fire. And we would take a reading as soon as the shell hit the target. And we would radio the information back to them so that they could readjust all of their equipment. We stayed out there until, well, I was actually discharged from San Diego. Mm -hmm. And one day going on leave, on a weekend leave, I walked into this bar and stepped up to the bar, and there is B. H. Murphy, Bascom's H. Murphy. From Texas. From Texas. He was the guy that I was with on Pelilo. Sure. And he had gotten out right after Pelilo. They had discharged him. And he had married a girl, and that's where he was staying. So I visited him as often as I possibly could. Mm -hmm. And I got my discharge papers from there and was sent home. And once home, how, how, how did you readjust to coming back to regular Natick life? No problem. No. Did you go back to work right away? or? Uh, I was off two months and then went to work to learn to be an automobile mechanic. Mm -hmm. Did you move home? Uh, yes, I was at my mother and father's house for, uh, well, I was dating a girl. And we decided to get married. We dated for about a year. And we got married. And as soon as I got married, my mother and father moved down to Cape. They bought a house down in the Cape. And I moved with Shirley into an apartment. And from the apartment, which was maybe about a year, we purchased a house at 16 Jameson Street. And you've been there since? Yep. How important do you feel serving in the military was for you? Well, I think then it was necessary. Uh, I don't think I would have, well, where I came out of it with a whole hide, I don't think I would have really given it up, but I wouldn't do it again. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that we ask um, a number of the interviewees is if you have any feelings or comments about 
the difference of public opinion regarding your generation of veterans in World War II versus those in the um, Korean conflict and those in the Vietnam War. How do you feel about that? Well, I think where it was World War II, and it was almost a necessity. People treated everybody, you know, with respect. There was no problems as far as I could see. Uh, the Korean conflict, I have problems with that one. I don't, I don't know how those, those Marines ever put up with that. And as far as the Vietnam thing, I, don't, I will never understand why the public didn't take their anger and their vengeance out on the government and on politicians. The people that went over there, the men that went over there, they didn't, they, they didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. In your experience, what do you think was the most challenging part for you? You mean in the service? Mm -hmm. well, I think Paris Island and Pelilu is probably the worst, the biggest. I mean, when you go to Paris Island, it's, it, it's just plain shock. Mm -hmm. So you, you compare that even to Pelilu, but you had a lot of combat experience, and Paris Island was right up there with it. Oh, yeah. Is there one thought, memory, or one comment that you would like to leave us with today, not only for your family to hear this in the future, but those who might be viewing this tape five, ten years from now? I hope the people that are running the world, the governments, have got enough brains not to ever start another one. Mm. But I really doubt it. You mentioned earlier your friend John. John Coates is a veteran of World War II also. Yes. Uh, the two of you are collaborating on, is it your memoirs, more well, or less? Well, we are on that too, but we're also writing a book. Not a book, a short story. Mm -hmm. I came up with the ideas, and I'm a lousy writer, and I know nothing about punctuation, but John does. And he's doing most of that, and I just keep throwing ideas at him. And I think the two of us have got something in this story. Mm -hmm. In fact, the other day he said, I would love to see it in the movies. It would make a good one. And he finally convinced me to write my memories of what I had done in the Marine Corps. Is that difficult for you? No, not really. I think the, the hardest part is going to be dates. Mm -hmm. But I've got that wonderful book. I can go into that and then backtrack. The know, book from, on World War II? And yes. Mm -hmm. The First Marine Division's old breed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it lays it all out for you. Yeah. We'd like to thank you, Bob, for this afternoon's interview. It's been a very rewarding experience for us, and we thank you for taking the time to see us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome. <laughs>